So again, uh, in the next uh, line, which has to do with the parameter of effort of virya, um, Atisha gives it a twist. So he says the supreme effort is letting go of activity. So, of course, he's dealing with um, energy in, in our Dharma practice, that we imagine that we, there is the goal and we've got to keep running, you know, leaping up over the Bodhisattva Bhumis until finally, ah, oh, we, we get Buddhahood and then we're going to be crowned and everybody's going to go, well done, well done, well done, son of good family. It's not like that. Buddhahood is not something which is achieved. It's not something which the ego has to be driving like a Ferrari, roaring down the main Bodhisattva highway until we finally achieve our goal. Practice is not like that. Because if we are thinking always, achievement, achievement, got to get there, goal, goal, who wants to achieve? Who wants to be a Buddha? The ego. The ego sees itself as suddenly being realized and, and endowed with all the qualities and something really very, very special. But the ego cannot be enlightened. So Buddhahood is not achieved by the ego making efforts. That just polishes the ego. So really, it is not a matter of what we gain through our practice. It's a matter of what we lose through our practice. It, the Dharma is a practice of letting go, not of accumulating more and more, even spiritual qualities. It's a matter of oh, release. So this is very important, especially in meditation, because sometimes people feel that they have to make tremendous efforts, efforts, efforts. And at first that seems to work. So that, you know, in the beginning we have to make a certain effort in order to accomplish anything. But at a certain point it becomes counterproductive. It's again rather like a musician, you know, in the beginning to master the, the instrument you have to, you know, make efforts. But at a certain point, if you keep trying to make more efforts, it, the music will never flow. There comes a point with any genuine musician or sports person where they have to let go and allow, as it were, the music to play through them. So that inwardly the ego drops away and there is a sense of the, the music just playing through. Or in art, you know, an artist who is always trying to get it right will never be able to succeed. Once they have learned the, the basics of how to paint, they have to let go of trying to achieve a result and just allow the brush to paint for them. As in Chinese art, you see this very clearly. You know, the, the, it's an, an egoless art, not based on effort but on release. So um, he would deal with this again when it comes to uh, concentration and not altering the mind. The point is that in genuine practice, we don't have to do anything. 
the, the, the point is just to know in a state of very open awareness and relaxation. If we push too hard, then it is again the ego which is in charge. The ego wants to see something, wants to get something. And that is um, an obstacle to actual genuine uh, realization when we think we should be experiencing something, recognizing something, something should be happening. And so we push to try to get something to, to, uh, that can satisfy. Basically, it's satisfying the ego that wants to know we're getting somewhere. But as I'm sure all of you who have ever done any practice uh, know, this does not this does not succeed in actually um, bringing us to a genuine realization. It is a very false um, state in which to be. So therefore, we don't, effort doesn't mean that we have to do anything. Um, so even on a practical level, I mean, people uh, feel, right, I want to be a good Buddhist practitioner. And so, therefore, we make efforts. We go on pilgrimage, we visit temples, we do prostrations, we make offerings, we run around the, the stupas um, to circumambulate, we make offerings, we read the sutras, we go on meditation courses, we take empowerments. We're very, very busy. <laughs> But in actual fact, what we need to do is just to sit. So therefore, the supreme effort is letting go of activity. Just sit. Now, of course, we are not saying, as with all of these, that, you know, visiting temples, making offerings, visit, having, attending uh, Dharma talks, reading uh, the texts, and, and so forth, are, are bad things to do, or useless. I mean, all these efforts that we make to um, incorporate the Dharma into our daily lives and to take part in dharma activities and so forth, are all good. It's not that that means that they are not good or that they're not necessary. They are necessary. But he's talking about the, the highest, the very best of all these qualities. It doesn't mean that anything less than the highest is no use. Of course, they're all good. Like the effort, usually, traditionally, effort is considered to be the effort to uproot the negative qualities in our mind, to uproot our anger and greed and pride, jealousy and delusion, um, both uh, now and for the future, and at the same time to cultivate their opposites, to cultivate contentment and generosity and patience, and, and so forth, and in this way to pull out the weeds in the garden of our heart and to at the same time water and cultivate the good plants. So those efforts are of course very, very important. But still the highest effort is to be effortless. We of course have to apply effort to learning. For example, if we are learning to uh, play an instrument or to paint or to do any sports, in the beginning it takes a lot of practice. We have to do it again and again and again until finally it becomes natural and then to make effort would be counterproductive. It wouldn't be, um, 
it would be an obstacle rather than a help. At a certain point, we have to, once we have acquired the skill, we have to relax and allow that knowing to come through in what we are doing. So, as I mentioned before, I mean, this is the, the highest of these qualities. So it doesn't mean that less than the, the perfect way of practicing is therefore not useful or, or even, you know, bad thing to do. It doesn't mean that. It means that at the highest level, we, this is how it would be. But of course, to get to the highest level, we have to work hard to get to the highest level of any of these qualities. Most of them are not manifesting for us spontaneously. They require a lot of prior preparation. I mean, obviously, if we say, oh, well, look, the, the highest effort is letting go of doing, so therefore I don't need to do anything and just sit around. I mean, well, that's lovely, but we're not going to get anywhere. I mean, even everybody is expert in not doing anything. Uh, so obviously, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that we don't do anything, but it means that the 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 as I said, the 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 real highest effort comes at a point where it becomes effortless that we don't have to do anything, we just have to be. Because we have already made all the prior preparations, so that at a certain point of itself, it just, like a river, just flows. We don't have to make the river flow. The river flows, that's its nature. So here he's basically dealing with spiritual practice. And so this becomes um, also in the next verse where he says that the supreme concentration is not altering the mind. Because again, people imagine that when we are concentrating, then you know, we have to almost force the mind into staying single pointed and we attain a, a certain level of, um, of uh, meditative states. And uh, so therefore, in that way, the mind is um, uh, almost forced into, uh, you know, constricted, one-pointed concentration. And if we are absolutely one-pointed concentration, then that is uh, meditation. So here he is saying, no, 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 it's not like that. Genuine concentration. We don't have to change the mind. All we have to do is know the mind. It's this knowing, this awareness. We don't have to change anything in the mind itself. What we have to do is be aware and know the mind. So, as most of you will know, in Buddhist meditation, there are usually two levels. Uh, and the first, which is called shamatha, meaning uh, to calm the mind, is the method, um, either we look at a flame, or we watch the breath, or we look at our thoughts, it doesn't matter. We choose an object, and then we settle the mind into being aware of that object. So the, the real benefit of shamatha meditation, apart from allowing the mind to become more calm and therefore more clear, is also to hone the ability to observe. Because normally when we are in our ordinary state of mind, we are swept along by our thoughts and feelings. As I said, it's like a river in which we are completely immersed and we are just flowing along with the river. Now we are stepping out onto the banks. And even though the river may continue to flow, we are not immersed in the river. We are 
separate from, there is a consciousness, an awareness, a mindfulness, which is not the river. So this awareness is very natural. We are always aware insofar as, you know, you can see me, you can hear me, you can understand. And so therefore you are aware. I mean, we are always aware, but normally we are not aware of being aware. In other words, we're always conscious unless we're in deep sleep. We're always conscious, but we're not conscious of being conscious. And so the shamatha meditation, one of the aspects is that it introduces us to our awareness as being a faculty of our consciousness, which is not the same as the conceptual thinking mind, which is busy chattering in the background. It's like if we have um, in a room with a television on, the television may be blaring away, but we are not watching television. We are reading a book or we are working on our computer. Our attention is elsewhere. So even though the television is still going on, even though our conceptual thinking mind is still going on in the background at the beginning when we try shamatha meditation, nonetheless, the focus of our attention is not on the background noise, it is on the object of our concentration. So we are learning how to separate the awareness from the stream of conceptual thinking. So this is first stage, very important. So once we have recognized our awareness, and are able to, to abide in that state of open awareness. As far as concentration is concerned, we don't have to do anything. We don't have to think special thoughts. We don't have to in any way alter the mind. We just have to know what is happening in our mind. That is enough. It's like, um, like a large bird, like an eagle, right? If when you have little birds, like sparrows, then in order to uh, fly, they have to flap their wings. A lot of effort to keep going up. But an eagle just flies. It doesn't need any effort. It just glides along on the currents with no effort at all. But that eagle is not asleep. That eagle is wide awake and very focused. Probably it's focused on its lunch, looking where it could be. But anyway, it's awake. And so our mind should be like the eagle, effortlessly opened into the expanse of the mind, but knowing clearly what is happening, moment to moment to moment, without changing anything just knowing. So the mind is completely relaxed, spacious, and aware. That's all. So that is the uh, practice for shamatha, that our mind should be in this state of total awareness without altering that, we don't need to change anything. We just have to know. And so then, the, of course, the supreme uh, jewel of the paramitas is the Pratnya Paramita. Um, I don't know in the Korean, yeah, yeah, in the Mahayana tradition also, Pratnya Paramita is female. 
right? The great Prajnaparamita statues um, from Java and elsewhere, which date back uh, millennia, are female statues. So, because, and in Tibetan, uh, Prajnaparamita is called Yumchenmo, means the great mother. Because all the Buddhas are born of wisdom. And therefore, wisdom is female. She's the great mother who gives birth to all the Buddhas. So she precedes the Buddhas. So, I mean, many of you, of course, uh, know the Heart Sutra, um, and this is considered to be the quintessence of the wisdom of the Pratyapanamita, the Heart Sutra, Kridaya. Um, in fact, at this International Buddhist Women's Conference called Sakidita, or Daughters of the Buddha, which is held in various Buddhist countries, um, on the first day, then the uh, Theravadin nuns, it's uh, um, Buddhism from all countries, uh, the Theravadin nuns chant the Metta Sutra, and all the various Mahayana schools chant the Heart Sutra, each one in their own uh, tradition and their own language. So we have Korean nuns, Chinese nuns, Vietnamese nuns, Japanese nuns, Tibetan nuns, and so forth. Each one chanting the same sutra, each one in their own style and their own language. So it, it's very um, heartwarming, literally. So, of course, wisdom is the crowning jewel of the Buddha Dharma. And, um, you know, the scholars spend many, many, many years studying and uh, debating and meditating on uh, the wisdom. So, there are many, many texts, many, many um, approaches to recognizing Buddhist wisdom. But here, Atisha says that the supreme wisdom, the highest wisdom, is not to grasp onto anything as a self. Um, I looked at, because uh, the Venerable Ludo was saying, what's that in Tibetan sort of thing. So I, we got the Tibetan and it says, Shirabji uh, Chungkangaya, Ngazin Mepa. Ngar literally means I. It's not even self, really. That's da. It's Ngar Zin. Zin means to grasp. So it's grasping on anything as me or mine, really. The point is that, of course, we grasp onto many things as being me and mine. We grasp on to our self-consciousness, we grasp onto our body, this is my body, this is my hand, this is, you know, my feet, my whatever, this is my memories, my opinion, in my judgment, these are my hopes and fears, these are my plans for the future. This is my life. This is who I am, and so forth. We are full of I grasping. So normally we just, um, you know, we grasp not only onto our own body, but onto the bodies of others. This is my son, this is my daughter, this is my family, this is my husband or wife, my father or mother. They belong to me. I mean, just recently I, I was um, with someone who was complaining, uh, they were Chinese, and they were complaining about the husband that their daughter was choosing, the man she wanted to marry. Um, and he didn't particularly think he was worthy, this man of the, his daughter, of the daughter. 
And so he was doing everything he could to obstruct the marriage. And I said, well, how old is your daughter? And he said, well, she's 33. And I said, well, at 33, I think she's, you know, old enough to make her own decisions. She's marrying him, not you. But of course, he was very frustrated that she, it was his daughter and that she didn't want to marry the person that he wanted to marry. So this very strong um, sense of possessing not only ourselves, but other people, that their lives also belong to, to us. And of course, not that we just cling to our own body and our memories and identity or the uh, identity of other people, but also possessions. You know, this is my jacket. This is my seat. This is my this. This is my that. And we think we own possessions. My house, my furniture. My anything, anything that we have, it becomes mine. I mean, even like, you know, we have a break and you go out and then you come back in again. Excuse me, that is my seat. <laughs> <laughs> have you bought the seat? <laughs> but within no time at all, it becomes mine. Isn't it interesting? So, the point is that right from the start, we have made false identification. And that false identification then um, just spreads out to encompass everything which we um, meet up with. So the 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 Buddha said right at the very beginning, if you remember, our first line was supreme understanding is to realize the meaning of selflessness. So he keeps coming back to this. And so here again, the supreme wisdom is not to grasp onto anything as, as me and mine, as self, ngar. This comes through genuine realization. I think intellectually, merely to say this is not I, doesn't really help too much, because who is saying this is not me, it's me. You know, the ego is just saying, right now I'm going to be, ego I'm going to be egoless, right? The ego says. And this cannot happen, right? The ego is just now playing at being non-ego. So the, the real genuine realization comes from a direct experience of the nature of the mind. The nature of the mind, our genuine nature, is not the dualistic consciousness in which we normally dwell. There is a subject, I, and an object, non-I, everything else. And as long as we live within that conceptual framework of dualism, of subject, object, self, and other, we cannot claim to be egoless. So meditation is not simply to make our minds more calm and peaceful or to have experience of, of bliss and so forth. The real aim of our mental cultivation is to recognize the true nature of the mind, which is called also our Buddha nature. It means that we go, we rent the veil of our ordinary conceptual dualistic mind to see directly the genuine source of our consciousness, which is totally non-dual and far beyond thoughts of self and others. It is to deal with far more with our interconnection with all beings than with our separation. 
So the nature of the mind, the ultimate nature of the mind, first of all is described as being empty. So therefore, this emptiness is compared to space. Because space, we cannot see it, we cannot grasp it, and yet everything emerges from it. We could not be here in this auditorium if it was not that there is space. And also these solid tables and our bodies, when they are ultimately analyzed, themselves are also space. So space is all-pervading, just like the empty nature of the mind. So a dualistic, a conceptual mind, which is run by the ego, divides us. This is why you come and you say, this is my chair. But at the same time that we solidify the idea of possession, at the same time we are all breathing in and breathing out the same air. We cannot say, excuse me, that is my air. Don't you dare breathe my air. We are sharing air. Air comes out and goes in. All the plants are likewise breathing in and breathing out. Space is what connects us. And likewise, the nature of the mind connects us. There is no division in the nature of the mind. It's not my Buddha nature versus your Buddha nature. Oh, my Buddha nature actually is rather superior to your Buddha nature. It's not like that. It doesn't mean little Buddha sitting inside us. It has to do with the open, spacious clarity of the mind. So the mind is empty. That means it is ungraspable, unseeable. It cannot be actually known just as space cannot actually be known. We can't see it, we can't grasp it, and yet it is everywhere. But unlike space, which is empty, the mind is also knowing. It's not just empty. Space doesn't know anything. The mind, the, the ultimate quality of the mind is that it knows. And so, in the Tibetan language, this is translated by the word selwa. And selwa is a, a difficult word uh, to translate into English because it has the idea of being luminous, bright, clear, and at the same time, cognizing. In, uh, so people translate it in different ways. They say clear light, luminosity, clarity, lucidity, cognizance, because there's no word in our language, in English language, to um, encompass all these ideas of this one little word, cell, selwa. But it means that the mind, although it is empty and spacious and ungraspable, Nonetheless, it is clearly lucid. We know. We are aware. Everything is projected through the mind. And we hear, we see, we taste, we touch, we think. Because of this lucid, clear, cognizant quality, which is the essence of our consciousness, of our awareness, which is like the sun endlessly radiating, effortlessly. We know. And this quality of the mind, which is beyond self and others, which is beyond subject and object, which is just is, beyond existence and non-existence, what the Buddha called the deathless, and which in Tibetan is called primordial wisdom. 
that very nature of the mind is what we have to realize and which is the perfection of wisdom, the prajna paramita. And that's our true identity. That's who we really are, all of us. But we don't recognize it because it's like the sky, vast and all-encompassing, but it's covered up with monsoon clouds. So all we see are the clouds. We look at our mind and think, oh, I'm hopeless. But that's because we identify with the wrong thing. We identify with the clouds. We don't see the sky. So it's important just to remember that this natural state of the mind, our pure primordial awareness is always with us. It's not something which we, we have to get from outside. Uh, the traditional example is of a poor person, a beggar, and they go out and every day they get in just a little money because they're going around begging, thinking themselves very, very poor. But in their hovel, in their, their hut, underground, there is a huge treasure, an immense millions of beautiful diamonds. But they don't know that. So actually they are millionaires, but they think they're poor because they're not looking for their wealth in the right direction. They're going out and thinking someone else can give them something. But actually the whole time, it's just there waiting to be discovered. So that's like us. We think that other people have to give us something, that we, we ourselves are spiritually poor, or that we have to make lots and lots of efforts in order to improve. But actually the whole time, the very fact that we can think and hear and t taste and touch is because we have this primordial awareness, but we don't recognize it for what it is. That's the problem. So the whole time we're millionaires, so the whole time we're Buddhas, but we just don't know that. That's our tragedy, and that's why the Buddhas have great compassion for us all. Our potential is vast, but we don't know. The supreme spiritual teacher is the one who exposes our hidden faults. And the supreme instruction is the one that helps us to strike at these flaws. The, the word for spiritual teacher is um, Kalyanamitra, or this, the, uh, you know, the good friend. Um, in the Mahayana, the guru is always called the good friend because they are the one who help us on the path. So it's sort of like if we go to see a doctor, then a good doctor will point out what is wrong with us. I mean, he's not there just to say, oh, well, essentially you're fine, don't worry, everything's okay, if everything is not okay. The reason we go for a doctor is because we want him to tell us what's wrong and then be able to help us to cure ourselves. So therefore, we don't want to um, have a teacher who only praises us and makes us feel good because he hopes that way we'll make bigger donations and, and stay with him. That he's afraid to tell us what's wrong because otherwise we won't like him and go somewhere else. That kind of teacher we don't want. We want a teacher who's honest and can see. He, they can see our strengths, but also they can see our weaknesses. It's like if we go to a gym and we meet with a trainer then if he's a good trainer, he will point out what is wrong, as well as accepting what is right. I mean, he might say, well, you know, your arms, your shoulders are not bad, but your legs are terrible. You've got to get working on those legs. And so we are not angry with the trainer for pointing out our weaknesses. We're grateful. Oh, good, that's what's wrong. Okay, now what should I do? Work on this machine. Okay, I'll work on that machine. So we are grateful. We want to be told what's wrong. That's why we go to the gym. 
As I said before, it's like comparable to learning any skill, to learning a musical instrument or learning a sport or, or learning anything. We need a teacher because the teacher will not only tell us how to do things properly, but they also will point out our faults. They will be able to say, no, don't hold your hands like that. Hold, you have to hold your hands like that, or, or so forth. Things which we ourselves wouldn't know. They can see because they are experts. And this means that when we train in whatever skill, we will do it properly because not only will we learn how to do it right, but we will learn how to avoid the, the faults. Of course, we don't want a teacher who's only ever pointing out the faults and never praises us for anything we do right. I mean, we have to have a balance. But what a teacher is pointing out is that the most important thing is that a teacher is able to understand where we are going wrong and, and put us back on track. And so therefore, also, um, the, the best instruction is one which helps us to deal with whatever are our particular weaknesses. Just as at a gym, you know, different machines are intended for different uh, parts of the body. There are machines for strengthening in the legs, machines for strengthening in the arms or the back or whatever. Wherever there is a weakness, there are the machines there that we work on to strengthen and so that we overcome our weaknesses. So likewise in spiritual practice, there are many different approaches and many different techniques. And for different people, different things are more helpful. It's not like there's just one uh, remedy suitable for everybody. Actually, there are many, many, the Buddha said he taught 84,000 different dhammas. And so, um, therefore, like in a big supermarket, everybody doesn't buy the same uh, product because even though there may be many different versions of the same product, different people like different ones. What is suitable? So likewise, in our spiritual practice, if we have a teacher who can show us where is our weak points and give us an instruction which can help us to strengthen so that we overcome these weak points, then that is really the very best.